Mackenzie Johnston with Tri-State Livestock News, bringing you discussions concerning fair cattle markets. Today we are chatting with Mike Calicrate, located in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Mike is an independent cattle producer, a business entrepreneur, and a political activist. What do you feel are the biggest issues standing in the way of fair cattle markets today? Just big meatpacker power and their political power. So with big money comes a lot of political power. And when you look at a company like JBS, who, who just basically bought out the global meat system with ill-gotten gains from their political power in Brazil. You know, the last three presidents were implicated in, in bribery uh, schemes with the Batista brothers and, and JBS. Uh, they basically stole the citizens of Brazil's money through bank loans and, and other uh, methods to buy up the, the world uh, uh, control, really, of the, of the world uh, meat supply. And, and then they end up pleading guilty, turning state's evidence, negotiating leniency agreements, and, uh, and they are now back uh, as CEO and you know, chief operating officers of JBS. So here now we have two of the most notorious criminals in the world being allowed to operate the biggest meat packing company on the planet. And so there's nothing they won't do basically to, to control and own and extract and exploit. And of course, if you just saw their, their last quarter earnings, it's, it's like ridiculous $322 million, a, a, a total record breaking amount of, of profit to these, to these gangsters really is, is what they are. And so that is really the number one thing we have to address is the abusive market power of, of a shared monopoly. It's not just a few big companies that, that are riding roughshod over producers and workers and, and the supply chain, but it is a really a, a cooperation of big companies that give them that shared power, which is like a monopoly. You know, and technically you'd call it an oligopoly, but it, we've been in a, a society that has really worshipped concentrated power and worshipped the richest among us. When in fact, we, if we've been more knowledgeable, uh, oftentimes they didn't get rich by playing the game fair. And so many of us were left behind along with our futures and our families and, and, and our food system and the ability to feed ourselves. So now we are totally dependent upon foreign corporations to eat, uh, foreign countries to eat. So what solutions do you think need to be brought to the table in order to address this highly concentrated beef packing industry? Well, you know, I, I really think the COVID thing has helped us realize that it has to get done. Hopefully we don't forget too quickly and, and, and just let all those workers go back to Tyson, JBS, and Cargill, and Marfrig, uh, Smithfield, and, and shoulder to shoulder again in that, in that very dangerous sort of work environment. Hopefully that we do stay focused on building the replacement food system. And so first thing we have to do is, is really break up the power. And I'm not talking about government buying meatpacking plants and operating them necessarily, but putting them under a set of rules that they can no longer exploit, lie, cheat, steal, ruin rural America with their, with their scheme of, of extraction, which is very similar to a mining operation. And, and they're right down to the end now where they pretty well mine the farmers, the ranchers equity out and We've got seriously broken communities as a result. And so if we can establish the kind of policy that will limit them from taking unfair amounts of, of capital and equity and resources from the public, then that's going to be a, a very, very important first step. The next step has to be to finance the building of the replacement. You've got to build it anyway, because the operations that these big companies are, are running are extracting from those facilities. They are not keeping them up. They run them at 100 to 110% all the time, and they're becoming worn out. And, and I just, that makes me think of the Tyson fire. You know, I think that deserves a very deep investigation. I, I really think they should start questioning some of the local people that actually know something about that fire. Maybe the firemen that arrived on the scene. Uh, what did they find? I mean, why did that? that? That didn't make any sense that there would be a fire in that plant. But now it looks like 
they're going to have some insurance to, you know, bring it up to date again and, and to rebuild some things. And they've got our money that they've stolen from cattle producers that they can now invest in some facilities. But the trouble with these big multinational corporations is the shareholder demand for profitability is greater than the need to run sustainable operations with long life and investment in upkeep in facilities. And so they just extract, extract, extract. And so we've really got a broken system now that, that's worn out. It's going to have to be rebuilt. And as a, as a society, I really think that the public should own much of the infrastructure from, gate, from the ranch gate to the plate. And, and the ranchers then can continue to ranch. They can continue to farm. And they get to do what they're good at, but have access to the consumer more directly to get more of those dollars back to that farm and ranch gate. You know, and it was in 19... Uh, 70 really that I've got the data going well actually back I've got the data going back to 1950 something but back when we had a lot of competition in the marketplace when 1978 in fact when when I had 20 buyers that I could sell to uh, out of my St. Francis feedlot we were getting around 65 up to 70 percent of the consumer beef dollar and it's the same measurement today it's the beef, it's the fresh beef that sells across you know, their supermarket scanner, whether it's Walmart, Safeway, Kroger, whatever you may want to look at, the government collects that data and they establish really an average price on, a, on, on beef. And so, and that goes back to the 50s. And, and so what I've done is, is charted that and we used to get 65 to 70% when there was competition. And as of last week, based on the, based on the May 20th report from USDA, we were receiving 32%. Now that loss represents about $1,500 per animal raised on a ranch. Now understand you've got to feed it. You've got to you know, make it weigh 1350 or 1380 was the average weight that week. So there's going to be some investment in adding that value and you know, raising that animal up over the next year after you wean it so that you can sell it as, as, a, as, a, as a finished beef animal. But, but still, the, we've lost fifteen hundred over fifteen hundred dollars based upon those numbers from last week of our share of the consumer dollar, and so at the same time as this abusive market power of the big meat packers have raised prices to consumers, they've also stomped down the price at, at the farm and ranch gate. So, but it's the, it's the same thing is true in every commodity you look at, whether it's wheat, corn, soybeans, cattle, hogs, poultry they have concentrated the wealth and then fairly extracted much, much more than, than a competitive market would have allowed. And, and so as a society, we have to wake up. You mentioned the whole come fire. Do you think any results will come from that USDA investigation into that fire? Not with Sonny Perdue at the, at, the, at the helm of USDA. I don't really think so. I mean, it was obvious what happened to the market. I mean, it's totally obvious. We, you didn't have to have an investigation. You just had to go interview a feedlot operator and anywhere in Western Kansas or any place that serviced that plant. Uh, we all know what happened. I'd really like to know what actually caused the fire. And, and I'd like to see, uh, based upon what could be a result of that investigation, but I'd really like to see some of these corporate executives in jail. Uh, there's, there's no reason that Batista brothers shouldn't still be in jail. And, and then we have this price fixing case on the poultry that Tyson has negotiated a leniency agreement on. Well, Tyson should be in jail. They should be in jail for a lot of things. I remember in 2004 when, when we were in the Alabama courthouse suing IBP, then Tyson IBP for any competitive practices. I, I don't remember the number. I should look it up, but it, I, I did look it up at the time. And I think they had over 50 felony convictions. And, and so wait a minute. A corporation with felony convictions shouldn't be allowed a corporate charter in any state in the United States, especially Colorado with our secretary of, of, of our, our attorney general, Bill Weiser, having been on the Obama antitrust team, which reviewed Meatpacker Power. I, will, I would like to ask uh, Phil Weiser, our attorney general of Colorado, why he grants them uh, a corporate charter in this state. Why not withdraw it? And hey, we can find somebody to run the plant until we can get some replacement 
uh, infrastructure built. But why in the world would you allow those criminals to operate in your state and extract the wealth from your citizenry and the resources from your environment? Unbelievable that that could happen. And the other thing about criminals operating in our food system, if it's a USDA facility, it's actually against the, the, the rules of USDA to grant a felon, especially a serial felon like JBS, a grant of inspection. How can you trust these people to produce safe food when you can't? Look at the number of recalls. And so while we're on that topic, let's get back to some good inspection instead of the non-inspection that USDA currently uses in large plants, and get back to some state-based inspection using our local veterinarians, using the vet techs that they might be able to hire to come in and help out at the clinic so that the clinic uh, can be more successful in the community and, and keep you more dollars at home. Let's hire you know, animal science graduates uh, to be inspectors on a state level. Finance it with the federal government's money that they're currently spending for USDA inspectors that are having to travel 300 miles one way to my place in St. Francis, Kansas to inspect for the week and then travel home on the, same, on, the, on the next weekend only to have to return again having no rest, hardly any sleep, and eating bad food all week and staying in a, in a, in a low-grade motel. So this is, this is how USDA, honestly, is treating their inspectors that have to travel this way no better, really, than, they, than the meat packers are treating their employees and their workers. And, and so it's such an exploitive system. But USDA is totally controlled by these big packers. The reason USDA doesn't enforce the Packers and Stockyards Act is because they believe in this model of globalization where it takes big companies to do business globally. They listen to the meat packers. We can pass any legislation we want, whether it's country of origin labeling, mandatory price reporting. We thought we really won when we passed those laws. But then we weren't at the table when they wrote the rules. And mandatory price reporting, for example, you know, they, they went to the table and said, well, we have to have this confidentiality agreement. So we can't know what the cattle are really bringing from the captive supply providers, which we know are getting a significant premium, which is at the disadvantage of an independent feeder that has to compete for feeder cattle and calves at the, at the sale barn against this feeder that's getting preference, which is illegal under the Packers and Stockyards Act. And, and so they killed the law, basically. You know, we, we passed country of origin labeling after a very long fight against the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the Big Mac Meat Packers. We passed country of origin labeling only to have that watered down to where it didn't cover ground beef. It didn't cover anything that was for the process and it only covered whole muscle in retail. Well, why wouldn't you wanna know where all the beef comes from? See, and that gets back to the rulemaking and the cowboys are never invited to the table. Do you feel there's any chance that we'll get MCOOL reinstated? I hope. And of course, I don't think it's going to be the big solution that, that some of the cowboys think it might be uh, because the big packers have the power to dictate price at whatever level they think they can get away with. And so there will be some punishment if, if we get in cool, if we get a better mandatory price reporting bill, if we decide that we're going to not allow captive supplies or meat packer control and ownership of livestock, if we do any of those things, these big packers are in a position to punish us. Going back to the very first part of our conversation where I said we have to take away that power to punish. We have to take away that power to dictate price and, and, and to control legislation and the outcomes of rulemaking. This is the power we have to reduce. We do need country of origin labeling, no doubt about it. But one thing we don't need is imports. We should be shutting down these imports and, you know, Trump mentioned that in, in one of his news conferences that he would shut down or he thought maybe he looked to he looked to his side. And I think he was looking at maybe Sonny Perdue or the NCBA people. And, and of course, he got an immediate response that said, you just blew it, buddy. You just said something you shouldn't have said. But the bottom line is we don't need to be importing all this beef. And when you consider that these that the majority of the imports are coming in through the same big meat packers that are stealing our cattle. They're stealing the imports from the Brazilian producer, from the Uruguay producer, from the Australian producers. It's the same companies that are searching the world for the cheapest of everything and have a similar power in other places to reduce price. And so producers everywhere lose. 
And if we can break up the power in the United States, which is the best consuming market in the world, we help producers elsewhere also. And so yeah, I spent some time in Argentina here a year ago, a little over, maybe closer to two years now, and their biggest fear is that they would become like the U.S., that they would get the same big meat packers in their dictating price and, and that they would be in a similar situation as a Montana rancher or a Kansas farmer or, you know, the livestock producers here. That was their biggest fear. And, of course, I, I elevated the fear as much as I could. Right. Uh, so they will fight to keep the market that they have. Right now, they, they don't have a totally controlled market and they're getting a better price as a result. You know, how do you compete with places like Argentina that have these awesome climates and unbelievable soils and grass and, and nutritive values that are equal to a, 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 an animal on full feed in a feedlot? I mean, uh, it, and then of course they've got our genetics and, and honestly, they just want to feed themselves in Argentina and they just don't really need to export and they shouldn't be exporting. They should just feed themselves and keep the wealth in the country. And we, and we should do the same thing. Absolutely should, should do the same thing. And I'm not saying that we should not do business globally. Uh, I'm happy to export if somebody needs something uh, or import if we need something, but don't do it to the detriment of societies in general and to the betterment of a handful of powerful corporations. What is your thoughts on Senator Chuck Grassley's 5014 bill to increase negotiated cash trade? It doesn't go near far enough. We should ban meat packer ownership of livestock. And, and basically what, what they're doing with that is catering to the, to the big feedlots. And, and so the big feedlots have got themselves in a bind. If, if you make them go to the cash market, they're, they're still not in a position to, to compete with the big packer. If the big packer was robbing the bank, the big feedlot captive supply provider would be driving the getaway car. The, the, the corporate feedlots that need to be negotiating price so that we can get our share of the consumer dollar back. Because all, all of our animals end up having to go through these big feedlots to get to the packer because we've lost how many? 85,000 small independent feedlots? They're gone. And these are the folks that actually tried to negotiate price. But just think about how hopeless it is to be in any feedlot. I don't care. And a big one might even be at more risk uh, trying to negotiate a better price out of a packer because the packer has all the power. If they just shut, shut them down and say, you're not gonna kill cattle for six weeks, you're basically, basically done, you're out of business. And so, we've, so it still all goes back to the breaking up of the power. But the fact is, even if you had a 50-14, uh, where they had to buy 50% of their cattle in the cash market, it doesn't matter. They've got the power to pay whatever price they want to those people that are selling those cattle in the cash market. Meanwhile, the big feedlots and the, and the corporate feedlots and the, and the packer control feedlots are riding along on those coattails of a weak seller in Nebraska setting the price. He's a weak seller. He has no power. And you're going to let him set the price for you? Well, you've got enough premium and enough of a preference from the packer that you get along very nicely in that game because you're just a middleman. You're buying on one hand, selling on the other, and making a margin. So besides breaking up the, pa the packer power, is there another way that we can restore competition within our cattle markets? Yeah, I think, I think we can sell a lot more of our product directly to the consumer. If you look at my blog at mycalicrate.com, I posted uh, a piece uh, this last week that broke down just how much they are, they are selling our $1,300 steer at a retail meat market for. And, and based on those numbers from last week, uh, they're getting about $4,500 a head. And we're getting $1,200, $1,300, $1,350 maybe, depending on the day or the weight of the animal. That is just absolutely insane because the rancher puts up 85% of the capital that it takes to put a steak on the plate. They take the risk of production. They provide the labor and the management stand the risk of whether it rains or not, disease and other things. And the packer and the big retailer who honestly don't put up hardly anything, 15% at the most combined, I mean, they're, they're making all the money. And it's because of that position of power, market power. And, and, and so I'm saying, if we can sell more direct to the consumer, we can bring a lot more of those dollars back to the farm and ranch gate. 
But the barrier there is there's not enough processing for the enough ranchers to be able to put their animals in the form of meat to, to be able to sell to consumers. And right now with COVID, you've got a very nice increase in the demand from the consumer wanting to buy direct. If we can get more, more state inspection approved across state lines, we, we then can start to move in a direction where we can do more business directly with consumers. Back in, in 1998, uh, University of Colorado did a DNA analysis on a quarter pound hamburger patty, similar to what McDonald's would have been serving at the time. They found 1,082 animals represented in a quarter pound hamburger patty. Now, what do you suppose it would be today? Well, I wanted to find out. So I called the University of Colorado and asked them if they'd be interested in rerunning that study again. I just got a flat no. Well, you know why? Uh, because it wouldn't be in the best interest of, their, of the donations to their, to their college uh, to piss off the big, the big meat industry. But you know it's going to be thousands of animals in a pound of ground beef. So tell the consumer that as well. So we got, we got the best story in the world. What we need is access to the consumer, and we have to build a lot more infrastructure to get that done. And one of the things that we've done, I think, is, as, as cattle producers is we beat up the little processor. Because we get beat up, you know, we just think we should be an aggressive price shopper like everyone who shops at Walmart. And so we go out and we negotiate and we beat up and we lever and we, we work one processor against another. And, and, and honestly, we've just, we've been a part of putting them out of business. Rather than paying them what they actually need to get good equipment and to get good help and train good butchers and perhaps even having a business their kids want to come back to, we have really been a part of that disappearance of these small plants by refusing to pay enough. And on the other hand, we've been having, you know, to compete with Walmart, you know, putting their sales on and, you know, convincing consumers the place to buy meat is Walmart rather than uh, directly from a rancher. So many barriers. And, and USDA, honestly, is the number one barrier to a, to a better food system. Uh, you know, we've had the revolving door uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, we've got uh, Al Almanza, who was the former uh, administrator of FSIS, worked for them a very long time. Uh, in fact, he was the one that allowed the rotten meat to come in out of, out of Brazil, JBS being a big part of that. And he, he, he allowed it to come into our country for 90 days, fully aware that it was rotten and had been treated with acid to get rid of the smell. Every other country in the world had shut off. Uh, the, the beef from Brazil that was, that was being sent out. And, and so finally, when Sonny Perdue was appointed as Secretary of, Ag Secretary of Agriculture, the pressure was so great from groups like RCAF that Sonny Perdue made Almanza stop bringing that meat in. Well, what did Almanza do? Went and went to work for JBS. That's the kind of the corruption that we have in these agencies. Not saying they're all bad, not saying we're all cops are bad either, right? We're talking about Abusive behavior, people who, who act badly when given power. USDA is full of these, has got a lot of these kinds of people in, in that administration and in that agency. Do you feel that if we don't get substantial change within our cattle industry, that will become vertically integrated? We're already vertically integrated. You're part of a vertical integrated system now as a rancher. You have no choice but to take the price that, that the feedlot is going to pay you. You're part of their vertical integration, except for you don't get paid anything. I mean, heck, if you were legitimately a, an equal part of the vertical integration, you at least might get paid as much as a chicken farmer. I mean, the chicken farmer with two jobs in town can pay his mortgage. You can't pay your mortgage on the ranch with two jobs in town because you don't have a town and, you, and, you do, and there's no jobs. I mean, you're worse off today not being in, in the deal. You're just not in the deal. You're the cost to be reduced. Tyson has already chickenized the beef industry. It's over. Now we're fighting for our fair share. And to get out of the top-down vertical integration, to get out of it and get back to a competitive market to where we have choices again and a fair share of the consumer dollar. But when you've got Walmart on top and Kroger and Safeway you are a price to be reduced, and they are in the position to get that job done through the meat packer. 
who they dictate price to and the meat packer because they have the power the monopoly power to pay you less they do it and so you're really part of the vertical integration that's currently in place today the small feedlots are gone they're just gone i mean when you look at look at the sale barns you might have one buyer carrying the order for two or three of the biggest feedlots and so there's no competition but what do you do when there's no competition? And it's been that way for 20 years or more. It's been that way since NCBA merged with the checkoff. It's been that way. We talked, we were talking about it clear back then. And we've done nothing about it. So you just mentioned the checkoff. What are your thoughts on the checkoff? Is it helping the producers? The, the checkoff needs the boot. We need to get rid of the checkoff. If you look at checkoffs in general across the spectrum of commodities, they're all failing. They're all failing. They are controlled by the monopoly power within that sector, whether it's corn, soybeans, wheat, cattle, pork, it doesn't matter. You're being forced to buy your own hanging rope. NCBA, armed with 40 million a year of our checkoff dollars, can buy all of the, all of the House and all of the Senate all of the time. And we cannot win when they have that much money that they are spending contrary to our own interest. Consumers have been dealing with price gouging for the past couple months and they continue to deal with it. Do you think there's a chance that we could price ourselves out of a product? Well, when you consider that not only are they price gouging, but they are delivering a less than quality product to the consumer, darn right we will. Stop producing an industrial product. On top of that, stop gouging the consumer. What the Packers did with their increase in box beef prices after COVID, and at the same time, the reduced price to the, for the cattle they were buying was, was such an obvious no-brainer that they have to be broken up. You have to do it now. It's, it's a national security issue. It's, a, it's an antitrust issue. It's all those things. And, and we can't lose the opportunity now. We should be protesting, but the problem is, you know, we could, we could call for a rancher protest and there'd be you, your neighbor, and a couple friends. I mean, they're gone. We've lost nearly half our ranchers. And the ones, and so many of the ones that are left are just really operating a piece of land for some, some rich guy that made his money on Wall Street, you know, a hedge fund operator or something. So we just don't have the numbers. And this is why it is so critically important to work with the consumer. And if you're going to work with the consumer, you're going to have to start to realize that diversity is a good thing. A lot of ranchers don't get that because they, they don't deal with it every day. Do you think there's a chance that, again, if the power isn't broken up at the top within the beef packing sector, if that isn't broken up and substantial change isn't made within our industry, that our beef will someday be completely foreign supplied? Well, yeah, I think that's, that's very likely. I mean, one of the first things after COVID hit is, you know, Brazil offered to feed us. Yeah. Of course, now they've got their COVID problems. But, you know, they probably are really less likely to, to continue to abuse workers, although Trump did show that he was more than willing to force workers back into those dangerous working environments. Uh, so, you know, we can't really say a lot there. But I don't think that we will be that big of importers uh, because we won't have the money to pay for it. And, and the problem with an importing country, if they don't have the wealth to be able to pay for what they import, countries aren't benevolent. They're not philanthropists. You've got to pay for stuff. And the fact is, when you get rid of your farmers and your ranchers, you've just gotten rid of your wealth creating base. You know, when you plant a seed in the soil and add water and sunshine, as if in a continual miracle, as Ben Franklin used to say, wealth is created. And so when you wear out your soils and let them wash into the Mississippi River and blow away in eastern Colorado, you will at some point starve and not have the wealth that you previously did. And so we really need to get back to a, a more holistic, regenerative type of a process in, in food production, which will not only create a lot more wealth, but it will also heal the land and fund the economy from the very grassroots. And, and so if we do end up being dependent upon foreign food, it won't be for long because we won't be able to pay for it.
If you could sum it up into one sentence, what does the cattle industry need most today? Uh, it needs cooperation among the members of the, of the cattle industry and in conjunction with the consumer and stop, stop allowing the wedges to be driven between groups and within groups. We've got to get rid of our prejudices. And I, I just recall from history when President Abraham Lincoln said he feared after the war corporate power more than the war itself. And he said, corporations will work upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is in their hands. Wow, that's exactly where we are today. So do you think there's a chance that our big cattlemen's organizations, NCBA, RCAP, U.S. Cattlemen's, um, the large state affiliates, KLA, NC, do you think they can come together on some issues and get on the same page? Well, I don't really expect them to. And NCBA is not a cattlemen's organization. It's a meat packers organization. So you gotta, you got to rule them out. We're not going to agree on anything, essentially, with the NCBA. But the other groups... Uh, they've been divided by the wedge, the corporate wedge, really. And, and I was there when much of that occurred, and I know, the, I know the history and the background of it. But I'm not sure they have to agree so much, but if they would all just agree that the consumer is our friend, the consumer is our, is our ally in, in you know, sound and, and sustainable food system, I think that changes a lot because that gets us going in the same directions. You know, if, if we're really listening to the consumer to what they want, it's a completely different food system than what the industrial system currently is delivering that's now controlled by the big corporations. And so with the consumer in partnership, we could rebuild a, an alternative pathway to the market, sort of parallel to the, to the big industrial system, and eventually just replace it and, and utilize it less, then we've really got something done. And, and the other thing I think that we can do is, is let's set some examples here in the next few months of some of this direct sale to the consumer business. You know, we've got, we've got some things we're working on right now. We've got some pretty significant examples of people who have been able to sell directly to the consumer. And let's report back what those dollars look like at the Farm and Ranch Gate. And we'll, we'll be making that information available to you. And that, I think, will get a lot of cowboys thinking, the right way. When they see how much money that they've lost to the power of the meat packer, they're going to hopefully start supporting some of the right things and be a lot less, as, as President Lincoln would say, a lot less prejudice. Central Grocers has brought a class action lawsuit against the four big beef packers. As we all know, RCAP has a lawsuit against them right now. And the DOJ is investigating them for price fixing. So there's a bit, essentially three lawsuits on the table right now against the four large beef packers. Do you think this is enough to set in motion change within the processing sector to regulate the abusive power that has been going on? No, I don't. And in fact, sort those out a little bit. If it's a private action against the big meat packers, you've got some law firms that are going to get to decide how that case gets settled. And very likely they'll settle that case. I mean, we, heard, we learned the lesson in 2004 in the Montgomery courtroom in Alabama against Tyson and IDP when the judge reversed the jury verdict and took that 1.28 billion jury award away from us, the cattle producers, and in fact made us pay the Tyson court cost of $80,000 after taking that $1.28 billion award away. We worked all the way into the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court didn't think the cattleman's case was important. They decided to hear the Anna Nicole Smith family feud case instead. And so if it's litigation and it ends up in, in private law firm hands, they very likely will, will settle a case, go home with a bunch of money, but not getting the injunctive relief that we need to make the market fair. So that's a big risk uh, in some of, that, uh, some of that litigation that you're seeing. The other one is if, it, in fact, we win these court cases and they stay with it and go all the way to the Supreme Court, they likely, under the judges that are seated there currently will refuse to hear the case or will decide against uh, a case that might break up the market power. So I, I don't have a lot of faith in litigation these days, unless it was a tobacco style litigation where state's attorney generals across the country, which right now 11 of, 11 of them are calling for some action. Now that's, the, that's good, a good sign uh, because if you can get 
state's attorney generals working with some of the top, more well-financed private law firms, you could have a, an outcome like the tobacco cases, where we literally take hundreds of billions away from these big corporations. And then you can rebuild, you know, what do we do with the tobacco money? Well, what you could do with the meatpacker money is rebuild an infrastructure that served people instead of corporations. So that could potentially have a good outcome. But I, I really think the best outcome is, is that we get a change in administration and that the Federal Trade Commission then can do their job. Right now they can't.